I would like for us to continue our study of evolution by going to the book of Genesis and just looking at the study of creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So Moses wrote in the first chapter of the first book verse of the Bible. Here, the Hebrew word is bara. It's used for created. Bara, along with the Hebrew word yatzar, are the words used to describe God bringing into existence different matters. And in uh, Genesis 2 and verse 7, Yatzar is translated formed, formed. Now these two, <clears throat> or these terms in particular, do not of necessity suggest to bring into existence out of nothing which is ex nihilo. However, the circumstances of creation show that there was nothing material before creation. Now, to me, that sounds kind of ridiculous to say something could exist before it could exist, but nevertheless, that's exactly right. But the circumstances of creation show that there was nothing material before creation. So God created the heavens and the earth out of or from nothing. I like the idea of out of nothing rather than from nothing because from nothing comes nothing. But God is able to speak things into existence from nothing. And the Bible is replete with references to creation and the fact, underscore the word fact, that all things came into existence at the fiat of God. We have it beginning the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God and the Word was with God, the same beginning with God. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was the light of man. The light shineth in darkness. Darkness comprehended it not, and so on. That, of course, is speaking more particularly to which one of the Godhead three was the active agent in executing deity's plan in the case of creation here. There are other places in the Bible where you can come into that, and I invite you simply to run your references. Uh, we don't say that that much, but we ought to. A lot of helps in the Bible. We talk about chapter numbers and verse numbers being helpful, and they are. But somebody else came through, and it's usually under each verse or down the middle of the page, you have these different references. They're not all may be as accurate as they should be, but most of them will carry you to other verses where it's talking about the same thing it was in a particular verse where you are studying. Now in the Genesis account, again I remind you it's Moses inspired of the Holy Spirit as every writer of the Bible was inspired of the Holy Spirit. And we find all the requisite forces of creation. Science informs us. Now remember what I mean by science. Science to be practiced must be practiced in the present in, in dealing with empirical matters, things that can be examined with the five senses. So science informs us that there are five forces that are necessary for creation. And they are time, energy, force, space, and matter. Time, energy, force, space, and matter. Now, every one of these forces are seen in the statement, 
in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There was time in the beginning. There's energy. That's God. Force created. Space, the heavens, ASV uses it that way. And matter, the earth. Now, back to the days of creation. When you go from day one through day six, you're noticing each day evolving gradation. The six days of creation were 24 consecutive solar days and brought into existence all things created. Now, I want to warn you in listening to some of these folks that do a tremendous job. I mentioned them last week on apologetics, especially the existence of God and even a lot of other things, deity of Christ, inspiration of scriptures. But some of them do not believe in what I just said, that the days of creation were 24-hour consecutive solar days, as we know a day to be today, and we commonly use the word D-A-Y day. So you got to watch out. They don't, they don't want to make it. In other words, in order to prove the existence of God, you don't have to get into that. So they just say, let's don't get into that argument. But you have others like Dr. William Lane Craig who really has gone all out to try to show that the earth is much, 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 much older than what you get from the Bible. The doctrine among scientists, evolutionists, of uniformitarianism means that as things work today in science, it's always worked that way, and there has never been any change. So they don't involve, and you wouldn't think that a, a secular materialist would. They don't want to involve an intervention of God stepping in, so that's why they don't like to think about miracles, or they don't like to talk about a worldwide flood brought on directly by God intervening, or what we have here, the earth created in six days by God. So they try to just sidestep that, or else they try to look at the literature, and I haven't pursued this this much, only to a degree, because I thought I had better things to do. <laughs> and Dr. Craig goes into how the literature that's used. Now, he believes God did all of this. He's not a theistic evolutionist, but... He thinks the literature used by Moses reflects Moses' education in Egyptian-type literature, and thus he's not talking about literal six days as we know of it, solar days. So be careful when you listen to these fellows. It's awful easy to take the good stuff, and they do have some good things, but then to drag a lot of that other stuff along with it. Uh, some of them aren't that way, but some of them are. Now, the first day, the heavens, the earth, light, and darkness were created on that day, Genesis 1, 1 through 5. I want you to notice at this point that light is created before the sun. Let me say it again. Light comes into existence by the power of God before the sun was ever created. That's interesting. Now, it gets us into a study of what do we mean by light. Is it light that now comes from the sun or like the light that comes from the sun? Or does it mean something more than just like when we turn on the lights so we can see or we walk outside so we can see from the sun? And what studies I've done, and I wouldn't be dogmatic on this because there's a lot not said. If it's not said, I can't deal with it. <laughs> but it seems to be this could be a matter of energy, the very energy functioning in the whole universe. That it would be like, we, and down here it doesn't get that cold a lot of times, but up a little further north, if you have a wool sweater. And back when I grew up, you know, you had heaters. And you might only 
heat part of the house, the bedrooms, we'd say they're closed off. We wouldn't have heat in there. And on one of these real cold days, bedrooms would be closed off. And you have company come over and they take off their wool sweater or whatever. And you take them in one of those rooms that had many heat in it and you put it on the bed. And sometimes those sweaters, static electricity, we just dance all through them. Well, that's light, but it's not coming from the sun. And they think this could possibly be what is meant right here. That kind of a light it doesn't mean no light. It just means just emphasizing more of the energy that might be here because there is no sun at this time to give its light. This is the first day. So at first, the universe is in its most basic and elemental form. Something happens. <clears throat> Here's where we see the third person of the Godhead involved in the creation. The Holy Spirit begins to move. Verse 2. Well, I thought Christ was the executor of the Father's will. And John 1, 1 and 2, verse 14, says he's the one that created. He did. But who's the former? Put that in quotes. Who's forming all of this up? The Holy Spirit. Now, that's the reason it can be said God, deity, the one eternal essence created. And yet each person of the Godhead three had a part in it. Now remember this is written for our level of understanding as human beings. I wouldn't begin to say I could even understand it from the standpoint of all the minutia that would be involved in all this happening. And yet it's clear that the Father, the first person of the Godhead, is always pictured as the originator of what is to be. The second person of the Godhead, the eternal Word, is the executor of the Father's will. And the Holy Spirit forms all of it up. Now, uh, does that happen? This is material creation, physical creation. Well, I want you to look at the creation of the spiritual Look at the creation of the spiritual body of Christ, the church, the family of God. Jesus had a part to play in that. We won't go into all the details. I think we know what part he played in that. But when he leaves this world, goes back to heaven, is set down at the right hand of God and ruling, what comes on the apostles on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit. Jesus had told the apostles that when he left and went away, he would send the Holy Spirit. And he would take his place. That is, the Holy Spirit would take Christ's place with the apostles, and he would be with them forever because Christ was in the flesh. The Holy Spirit wasn't. And it was through the Holy Spirit revealing the will of Christ that the church is put together. They spake as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So we see the activity of each person in the Godhead, whether it's the creation of the material things or whether it's the creation of spiritual things. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have their place to pray, to play. And thus, you see that the Holy Spirit moves or broods as an old hen with her little bitties trying to take care of them and organizing them and doing whatever. And some think they've discovered a contradiction because the sun and moon are mentioned as being created on the fourth day, verses 14 through 19. I've already mentioned all of that. I don't know how to go into a lot of detail on the matter of what that light's all about. Because if you'll notice when you go through the Bible and it speaks in the area of what science in the last 500 years has delineated and labeled and all this kind of thing as they've discovered it. Well, since there was no scientific terminology like that in these days, then very general words are used. So it's certain that it was not until the fourth day that the sun 
became the permanent appointed center of radiation for the moon. And thus he created two great lights, greater light to rule the day, a lesser light to rule the night. And it's interesting to note that it's the moon shining, but how is it shining? It's reflecting the sun's rays. So even when the moon is bright, not bright like the sun is bright, but it's reflecting the brightness of the sun. I think it's very interesting just in that, how God cho chose to do that. Well, that's the first day. And the second day, which is in verses 6 through 8, it involves the firmament in the midst of the waters and the division of the waters from the waters, verse 6. Well, the language indicates the formation of Earth's atmosphere. Now, I don't know exactly how all of that was before sin entered the world and changed everything, not just cutting man off from God, but changed everything. It changed everything ultimately as far as the world was concerned by Adam and Eve being kept out of the Garden of Eden, which was different from the rest of the world. But then when man got so evil, Genesis 6 and 7, he destroyed the world by a flood. And then it changed completely. I was going to bring this. I forgot it. Uh, Jody was reading last night, I guess it was, wasn't it, last night? Um, about, and some of you remember this, the big uh, tsunami brought about by a terrible earthquake volcano actually erupting down in Indonesia in uh, 2004, in which there were, I forgot how many, 100,000 people killed. 200, 200,000 people killed because that tsunami, that tsunami came uh, going over 300 miles an hour when it hit land in places. And it was upwards of how many feet? <laughs> Way up there. And uh, it changed the, what do you call it, the leaning of the earth, uh, axis of the earth, to the point that the earth wobbles a little more now than it did before that thing happened. Now, maybe that's the reason some of us stagger around a little more. <laughs> but, but, but the point I'm making is, I wish I'd thought to bring that exact thing. The point I'm making is, if God through natural means, and I say God, if those natural laws doing what they did can cause that kind of change of things, then imagine when God speaks directly, to nothing to break something out of it. Or when he speaks on each day to do whatever. The doctrine of uniformitarianism is it's just simply a false doctrine to say that everything that's happening, to the, everything that happened in the past happens as it does today. and does not allow for God to enter in. Now he can do that by a miracle or he can do that through natural means, providential care as we normally say. But in the case of the second day, where he's separating, forming up everything as far as the atmosphere of the earth, even that changed after the flood. And the flood was a direct consequence to so many people sinning and refusing to change. So we're talking about the atmosphere that circles the earth, verses 7 and 8. Let me read to you what the old commentator, Matthew Henry, has to say about this. I think it's interesting. I'm quoting from him now. We have here an account of the second day's work, the creation of the firmament in which we observe, one, the command of God concerning it, let there be a firmament, in, a firmament and expansion, so the Hebrew word signifies, like a sheet spread or a curtain drawn out. This includes all that is visible, of the, visible above the earth, between it and the third heaven, the air, its higher, middle, and the lower regions. The celestial globe 
and all the spheres and orbs of light above. It reaches as high as the place where the stars are fixed, for that's called here the firmament of heaven, verses 14 and 15. And as low as the place where the birds fly, for that also is called the firmament of heaven in verse 20. Again, that's from Matthew Henry's complete commentary. Now, Matthew Henry lived a couple, over 300 years ago. So his usage of modern day terminology wouldn't be the same. But it describes more how the ancients saw things. I think we get the idea because science has advanced so much in the last 200, 300 years. And my, look what's happened since World War II as far as the advancements of what we discovered. That those people just didn't know anything. They just didn't know anything. But they didn't express what they knew in modern scientific terms. And some things had not been discovered. Science simply discovers what's already here. This may sound ridiculous, but I was thinking about this. We used to play out when I was little out there in the woods and all around. And sometimes, I'm talking about when I was seven or eight years old, somewhere along in there, you go out there and if mama knew I'd been playing out all that time and she didn't know where I was and there were dogs hither and yon, come back in and before bath that night she gave me a full inspection looking for any ticks that might be on me. Has anybody ever been infested with seed ticks? Do you even know what seed ticks are? They're the fresh hatchling little ticks and they're hardly able to see and if you ever get into those things, you'll just have to about take a bath and alcohol to get them all off. Well, now how does that come tie in with this? She knew of seed ticks. She knew how they worked. And she knew where they were to be found. And so she had to investigate me to find them. <laughs> they were there or they weren't. And a scientist can see everything around him. Even scientists of long years ago could see everything around them. But they had to investigate to find out the particulars about it. And I suggest it's interesting to read about some of these fellows, just what they had to do to find out about all these things. Now, the third day, verses 9 through 13, involved the distribution of land and water and the production of vegetation. The dry land called earth, the firmament, the heights, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, verse 10. Vegetation is introduced in verse 11. And in verse 12, God pronounces the work good. That's the third day. The fourth day, verses 14 through 19, And allow me just simply to quote what the pulpit commentary said on this. I quote, With this day begins the second half of the creative week, whose works have a striking correspondence with the labors of the first. Having perfected the main structural arrangements of the globe by the elimination from primal, primeval chaos, of the four fundamental elements of light, air, water, and land, the formative energy of the divine word reverts to its initial point of departure and, in a second series of operations, carries each of these forward to completion. The light by permanently settling it in the sun, the air and water by filling them with fowl and fish, and the land by making animals, and finally man. The first of these engaged the divine artificer's attention on the fourth creative day. Thus we come 
to day five, verses 20 through 23. The waters and the air that were separated on day two are on the fifth day filled with their respective creatures. Now notice how God created sea creatures and fowl separately and independently. In other words, while all creation shares commonality, birds did not evolve from fish. But if you're an evolutionist, you can't view it that way. Appreciate also the fact that with the different creatures, God assigned a proper habitat in keeping with the design of the creature. Each creature brought forth after their kind, Moses wrote in verse 21. Now, I want to stop here and mention what I think I did some time ago, but for emphasis' sake, let me point out. When we speak of evolution, the basic meaning of the word is change. Are there changes within kinds? Yes. I simply invite you to look at the various dogs and the changes in them. Some of those breeds of dogs 500 years ago didn't exist. But they do now. And you can see that in a lot of things. But you're never going to see a bat change into a pigeon. Or an alligator into a horse. It's always going to be within a kind, and everything produces after its kind. People by genetic processes and crossbreeding and so forth have developed new kinds in the sense of kind being defined there to mean within a given, quote, kind as it's used here. So let's keep that in mind. Now, to the sixth and final day of creation, verses 24 through 31. This day involved the production of the higher or land animals and the introduction of man. Now, notice everything from day one through day five is getting the shore ready ultimately for mankind. Now we talk about the grace or favor of God that he favored us and allowed us to be born in this nation. Don't think we should ever stop thanking him for that. But also realize the responsibility to let the bonus to have all these freedoms, things to do with that other people don't. But look at the favor of God in creation. He created a place just for man. He did it in Five days, and then he begins to put other things there, man being the last. Man is the apex of God's creation, verses 26 to 27. He was not made ex nihilo out of nothing, but he was made out of the dust that was created one on day one. That's always found interesting. I don't know why. I guess I'll never know why. But he creates the dust, if you want to call it that too, on day one. But it's on the sixth day that he creates men, man out of that, Genesis 2, 7. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The Hebrew nephesh corresponds with the Greek word suke regarding soul. But I think, and I've said this before, you may have forgotten it, but many times we think that that means the inward man was created at that time. Well, of course, it was infused in man. But when you look at every animal that's destroyed by the flood a few chapters later, and it says in every beast that has 
the breath of life. It's plural, breath of life, in whose nostrils are the breath of life. Then you think, well, you mean all those creatures besides man also had a soul, like man has a soul? And you realize something's not right here. And, of course, you know that it's not the Bible. You know it's God's Word. It's infallible. He said it there. So it must be my thinking. And so it is that when you read man became a living soul, it is true God fathered the spirits. Hebrew writer tells us that. But he's talking about that which man still uh, has in common with the biological functioning of a dog or a cat or whatever those animals were back there that were first created. So that's one reason that scientists today can do certain tests on certain animals, guinea pigs, monkeys, and so forth, before they ever get to man, try and find out if some sort of antibody or some sort of thing works. Verse 30, I think, makes that pretty, pretty clear. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given even greater herb for meat. And it was so. There is a biological life that is not the eternal life of the spirit. Surely nobody's going to look at their cat, or their dog, or a fish, or something and say, that thing doesn't have life at all. Well, yes, it has life. Nothing else, we know it has life because we can kill it. <laughs> but yet when something like that's dead, it's just dead. It ceases to be because it does not have the spirit fathered by God that is the real you to dwell in this house made especially by God for it on this earth, an earth created especially for man in this body. And so it's good in the sense of rightly dividing the word of truth that we recognize that and the word studies because we have to reconcile the Bible with the Bible. So man is singular in that man is created in the image and likeness of the Creator Himself. Because at the point that man became a living soul, biological life, God infused in him that spirit that's fathered by God. Now, in the act of procreation, once set to go as God set it to go, everything started by a miracle, but then law took over, and there's a law of procreation. Then when a man and a woman conceive a child, on that basis, God makes a spirit that will never cease to exist. That's always been all my life, something that should make everybody having children sit up and take notice. That when you have children, you're bringing children to the world in which God has created a spirit that's like no other one to be in that body. And when that body goes back to the dust from whence it came and biological life is no more, that person made in the likeness of God will continue to exist forever. It'll either be eternal life or eternal death according to how we live in our bodies on this earth. So as we look at this, we see that man is more consequently than dust and biological life. Man has the eternal spirit. So Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 and in 2 Corinthians 4.16. Now it's of great importance that the universe of the earth had a beginning they did not evolve over eons of time, whatever, however long the evolutionists must make that. Uh, one really interesting thing, if the days are not literal days as we think of a day, then how do you have plants, existing for thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years, without light like we have from the sun because it was created sometime later. Well, later to the evolutionist, the theistic evolutionist, is millions of years. 
Well, he couldn't. Not the way God made the thing. He just couldn't. So, since the universe had a beginning point in time, and scientists were hard to admit this, it is running down because they all know the second law of thermodynamics. By the way, the Hebrew word pronounced yom, transliterated yom, which is used here for day, it can mean an indefinite period of time. But I think if you go to any Hebrew scholar and you ask them about, well, when it says one day or day one, it loses the indefiniteness of it. And it becomes a day just like we know what a solar day is. And after all, Moses was writing for people who knew what a day was just like you do. So it's also evident from the Genesis account that creation was not only ex nihilo, but also ex deo, full grown. You know, there's Adam's real age and there's Adam's apparent age. Somebody says, well, how old were Adam and Eve when they were created? Well, there's an apparent age. Evidently, they were old enough to bear children because they were commanded to do so. But when Adam had, been, Adam had been here a day, how old was he? He was day old. How old was she? She was a day old. But what was her apparent age? Well, let's say he was 22 and she was 20. I don't know. But she was, he wasn't 22, actually. And she wasn't 20, actually. She was one day old, and he was one day old. So God could create everything on this earth grown and looking like it's functioning, as it did, but like it had grown up here and moving right along. Now, people talk about light, and they're still talking about light, and great minds are investigating it. No less than Einstein did some tremendous investigation of it. So they know light travels so fast. And they know light comes from these distant stars thousands and thousands of light years away. So that we say the light hitting us today, well, that was thousands and thousands of years ago. More than, who knows, maybe millions of years ago that the thing started shining for the light because it goes fast for it to get here when, when it does get here. So from the place of its emission so far away to getting here meant that the light we're having now, energy and so forth, uh, it had to start way back before any young earth idea. Not if he created everything, boom, as if it was all working because he had created that life from the source of his emission. Right on down as it travels, right to get to earth. What is difficult to understand about a God who can speak everything to existence out of nothing? I don't understand why that is a problem unless you don't believe in God. Or else you've got a God in your mind who's about halfway human or some sort of thing like the Greeks and Romans thought about. So it's important to notice not only in the refutation of organic evolution, but also because the universe and all things therein were mature, they were aged at the time of the creation. And I think that really explains the dating problems that geologists get into. And some of these fellows I mentioned originally do a lot of work in proving the existence of God, the deity of Christ and all that, and they have done a great work there. But they can't accept this. I don't know how they miss it that God could create everything with apparent age from light to here. So keep that in mind. Now next week I hope to end this up. But today that's where we're going to stop with those days of creation. 
All I can say is that you need to study it. And you need to be prepared for it in dealing with people and teaching your own children, yourself, especially maybe having to deal with some people who are in the schools because I promise you them, most of them are going to accept evolution one way or the other. But if you're not a child of God, now's the time to become one <clears throat> because all this stuff that God spoke into existence and by the word of his power, he continues to uphold and all the laws of nature that he invented works, all that he can call to an end. It's his to do with as he pleases. And he knows exactly when he will call it all to an end and stop this time of probation and call all men who have ever lived into judgment for him to be judged according to the law of God that governed them at the time they were on the earth. There's a great day coming, the judgment day. Everything that's ever been done wrong will be righted. One of the great things about the judgment day is that justice will be fully served. Nobody will escape anything. No wickedness will go unpunished. On the other hand, all the blessings that people deserve and maybe never received in this life, they'll receive. Thus, to use this life for what God intended, to find him and serve him faithfully, one must believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of his sins, confess his faith in Christ, and be baptized in Christ for the remission of sins, and faithfully live on this earth in the church until Christ calls you home, or God calls this all to an end and brings all of us into judgment. If you're a child of God, not living as you know you ought to, private sins, Repent of them. Confess God for forgiveness. And he will forgive. If you brought reproach on the church by the way you live, then you ought to want the church to know that you're turning away from that. You've recognized it. You're ashamed of it. And you want to be better. And you're asking God to forgive you and asking your brethren to pray for you. Brethren, it is a marvelous thing to know that your brethren are praying for you. To know that there's that sympathizing ear, we all fight the same fight. The devil is our enemy. You don't have an enemy any greater than the devil, and neither do I. But we don't have a friend any greater anywhere than Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. We need to think about that. If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to do so while we stand and while we sing.